mean, we're five people. We learned pretty quick that we had to have a schedule, otherwise it was going to fall apart. <laughs> um, we need to set expectations with our own audience about when to see us. If you don't, then I, I feel like you're going to lose out on your, your repeat viewers pretty quickly. We typically have like a two week buffer of videos ahead of us. And we do that simply because our content doesn't require just one person to make. It usually requires minimum four people to make. At least 50% of our content is recorded off stream. We always go into it thinking about what we can put up onto the channel. And even beyond that, when we're recording off stream, sometimes, especially if it's a multiplayer game where it's first person say, so everyone's perspective is different. All four members that are currently recording are recording their own perspective so that they can all be edited together and you can splice together videos mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Say we're playing a game on stream and we want to get some additional people in there. We'll offer that to our patrons first, mm -hmm. which we have a, a private little channel on there. Something simple that I feel like a lot of content creators do, which is just to let your own community vote on what you play um, on our, mm -hmm. our Patreon. In my opinion, you should always play whatever you're drawn to, because if you don't, then you're going to get burnt out and you're going to yeah. you're going to hate what you're doing. But at the same time, I think it's super important to look at your analytics and see what's actually trending of the stuff that you're playing. Like you don't have to chase trends. I don't think that's ever a good idea necessarily. But find out what's clicking with your own community. Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to the Becoming a Creator podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ash and Enna of Stump Gamers. Stumped is a group of friends that play co-op games together, gained a following over 500,000 over on YouTube. Just fun, lovable. Look at any of the content. You can tell right away, right? This is the first time this actually has happened this season of Becoming a Creator as well. We got a collaborative effort with both you guys on. So uh, super happy to have you both here. Really Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks yeah. for having us. First off, kind of like to start with a couple little rapid fire questions, get a little interest. Mm -hmm. Hit me with it. What is one game you hate that everyone else on the team <laughs> loves? I mean, I've, I've got one that we're still currently playing, so I almost hate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it'll be understandable because we're playing it to death right now. We're currently playing a game called Played Up, which is a fun kind of roguelike-y, overcooked kitchen simulator kind of game. It's really fun. Everyone else on my team loves it. It's great. It's the kind of game that like maybe you can sympathize in the idea that like after you play a game 40 times, you've you've probably reached the extent of, of sure. the content that's available in that game. I think Ash is I'm just bad, bad at the game, and that's yeah, why that's he doesn't like it. Because you're bad and you don't like it? I don't know how I am with games. <laughs> no, same. I'm like, I don't want to play games that I'm bad at. No, no, thank you. How about you? Honestly, okay, this is, this is also because I'm bad at the game. So I am the newest member of Stumped, and they got really popular, or we got really popular doing Gang Beasts. And so they've had so mm. much experience playing Gang Beasts, whereas me, I am a baby. I, I'm very bad at the game, and so I just come in and get destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably my least favorite just because I'm very bad at it. I don't like losing. I'm a sore loser. Well, then on the other side, what's the best game you played collectively as a group? Rounds. <laughs> I mean, Rounds is great. I, was... I love Rounds. I was going to say Gang Beasts, honestly. <laughs> um, I think that where our content shines is games that are almost so mindlessly simplistic that it doesn't take any mental energy to play the game. So we end up just having a co random conversation about whatever we want, and our fingers are just mindlessly going on their own. Yeah. Gang Beasts has gotten to that extent. We play a lot of board games that are very simple that get to there as well. And that's where... I think our content shines the most is because we end up just like treating it like a podcast that are talking about whatever instead of talking about what's actually happening on screen. Mm -hmm. What's the most embarrassing thing that's happened during a recording, maybe a video, maybe something your audience gives you, <laughs> gives you some smack for anything like that. Ooh, I can give a recent example that she did to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we like to Ash, Ash and I have this rivalry going just cause we're really good friends and Ash's wife, Jasmine, is my best friend. So I always make fun that like I'm the better husband. So we've always had this sort of rivalry since I joined. So we've always been trying to prank each other <laughs> and to like show each other up. Mm -hmm. And recently, Jasmine took a picture of Ash's face when they were out to dinner. And it's like Ash is being super like judgy and like staring at the camera with like a frown. And we turned that into one of our emotes, which is one of our most popular emotes. But uh, for a while, Ash did not like it. He's like, no, it's like a super close up of his face. <clears throat> did not want it as an emote. We're like, OK, we'll do it for 24 hours. But it was so popular that we still have it on the channel. 
That's and the stuff that sticks, right? And right. One one day we're playing a round of rounds, and Anna's wearing a hoodie, and she says, "It's getting a little hot in here," and she she unzips her hoodie, and just in big, big, huge, full full coverage on the shirt, my full face of that oh email on her shirt. Yeah, that was that was that was pretty good. That oh, was that's great. pretty solidified then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then spill the tea. Who's the weakest gamer in the group? Oh, me. A thousand percent. Like, there's no question. A lot of our commenters like to keep running tallies of, like, who's won the most in, in rounds or gang beasts or something. Guaranteed, right. I'm always bottom trashed here on every single game. The only thing that I crush everyone else at, and shockingly, no one else in the group likes to play these games with me, is racing games. I hmm. just, I have over a thousand hours into Track Mania 2. That was kind of my bread and butter back in the oh, day. Um, nice. But yeah, for whatever reason, no one else wants to play those games with me, so we never play those. See, they like to beat you. That makes them feel better. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm the punching bag of the group. Now that we're warmed up a bit, let's dive even a little deeper in some of this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Stumped has been a group uploading content to YouTube for over eight years, which is incredible. Awesome, by the way. Tell me how you guys kind of all met and decided to start gaming together and what was the inception for this stumped originated with me my wife jasmine and our friends price and rick before stumped even posted content uh, to youtube the four of us we would always go over to to rick's place either on like new year's or holidays and we play pathfinder or dnd some board games stuff like that so we were always kind of a gaming group together and then I, I don't know what it was. It was that New Year's right before February 2014 when we launched on YouTube that I had the idea, hey, do you guys want to like come by? And I've got like this crappy Yeti microphone. We could all just kind of like huddle around it and see if we can make some some YouTube stuff. That's kind of how we, we formed up. It's just kind of like a random idea to give it a, a shot. And so it was kind of with the intention of let's put this on YouTube. Let's see if we make a channel around this or let's see if anybody wants to watch it. Like we had no intention for sure. No one was going to take it seriously sure. and for a few months. No one did. We didn't even monetize for the first eight months or, or, or so that we, we put stuff up on the channel. And was there like anything off of those first couple months that you were like, oh, this is great. Like we got this, this, like, this is really good content. We're really happy with what's going on here. We got to iterate off of this, make, Make improvements or was it just kind of like hey let's just keep gaming and uploading it and see what happens i'd say like the first six months or so of stumped we were throwing everything against the wall just to yeah. see what stuck and it became pretty clear we were doing local co-op stuff we were doing some online co-op stuff and then some of us were also putting like civilization 4 tutorials and like solo binding of isaac content and, and other mm -hmm. solo content and it pre became pretty clear pretty quickly that like Everyone on the channel was there for the co-op stuff primarily. We recentered around that after after like four to six months or so. For streamers who are just maybe starting out, doing their own channel or whatever, do you have any tips for people like in terms of finding people to play together with? I mean, obviously you guys are such a tight group and maybe that was just because you already had that group, but I guess do you have any words on that yeah in a lot of major cities there are like streaming group get togethers. Like I know in Portland we have the Portland it's POBA. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but there are groups like that, that they were all like streamers and content creators and they have get together. So if you live in a major city or close to a major city, guaranteed there's going to be a group of streamers. I know that there's a huge community down in Texas because I've met a lot of them. I know that there's a streamer group up in Seattle as well. So really reaching out to those groups and finding them is a great place to start because one, it's all everybody that knows about all the trials and tribulations that you're already going through and might have some advice and they're yep. local. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, same thing, even like PAX events, E3 or mm -hmm. whatever. I don't know if you've been to any of those, but uh, oh, yeah. that's, that's cool to see. Especially, I mean, to your guys' point, meeting up in person is like, that's awesome. A lot of the people, obviously, I play with a lot of people online in general, but I'd say if, if you can't, and if you're, if you're interested in the, the kind of games that we play, like look to those particular communities. I'm not trying to plug our own communities, discord, but like yeah, communities cool. like us that have centralized discords or other forums say they typically have looking for group type stuff where, where yeah. people that are like-minded would like to play games together as well. Mm -hmm. If you can't get together locally. I've noticed that stump has, you know, the weekly streaming schedule. I'm sure that keeps all of you guys kind of organized, but have you seen it, you know, it's importance and the consistency with your own audience and that building process over the time? Like, did you always have a schedule with us as you were starting out? I mean, we're five people. We learned pretty quick that we had to have a schedule. Otherwise <laughs> it was going to fall apart. Um, 
that said, like we've become more diligent, especially over the past couple of years and, sure. and especially more with Twitch. We need to set expectations with our own audience about when to see us. If you don't, then I, I feel like you're going to lose out on your, your repeat viewers pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. On your website, you show which games you're going to be playing on the dates and times with that. It, do you ever struggle with figuring out like what's going to be the next scheduled thing with it? Or do you schedule far enough and head to where it's like, all right, we don't need to stress about this. Are keeping up our schedule. We record several times per week mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we, we typically have like a two week buffer of videos nice. ahead of us. And we do that simply because our content doesn't require just one person to make. It mm -hmm. usually requires minimum four people to make. And so making sure that we have that much of a backlog that we, we don't have to scramble and rush to get something out tomorrow really helps reduce our stress on this. Yeah, especially because life <clears throat> happens and, you know, like we like, could, we just got COVID. So yeah, like me, me and her and my wife, we all just got COVID a couple of weeks ago and we had to take a huge break from yeah. stuff. So having that kind of backlog really helps. Mm -hmm. So then share with me kind of your guys' strategy behind each person streaming individually and then even coming together twice a week with that and kind of how you manage that. So especially having it all under under one brand, having it all being under stumped, I'd say that the first part is I, I like to, to make sure that we're all being consistent, that we're all sounding the same is a mm -hmm. big part to me and that we're all sort of putting out a, a quality on Twitch or on YouTube that looks fairly similar to one another. For that, we do all use the identical microphones and the identical audio interfaces so that we're all our voices should all be sounding in the same ranges of each other beyond that we all have computers that were built by me we're all recording in the exact same quality the exact same way on obs and whatnot beyond that we're branding ourselves sort of in a similar way with each of our stream overlays and and things like that so it shouldn't look radically different if you're popping into any of our streams. But there is a, a, still our own freedom to do what we want on our own solo days. Because I like to play a lot of, I feel like, different games than most everybody else. Like, I play a lot of horror games. I play a lot of visual novels. Um, right now, I'm completely obsessed with GeoGuessr. We're still allowed to, like, play those games and have it still be within, like, my particular personality or what I want to be able to show and bring to Stumped, you know? Yeah. So we still have that freedom of making it individual, but also all uniform at the same time. Yeah, that's super cool. So you still have that kind of consistency in the quality of what's being mm -hmm. delivered to the audience, but then you also have like these different perspectives of the games, the actual creator, the direction that you might be going, mm -hmm. but it's also still... I would assume within a similar tone of, you know, what's happening for it, right? Exactly. Yeah. We all sort of understand generally what our audience wants to see. With sure. Everyone sort of focuses in on their own genres, their own their own unique subset of games, but we all sort of understand what our general overall audience wants to see. And do you guys at all stream onto separate accounts, like have your own channel pages that also can coordinate with, you know, the main page that you guys are all working towards? Or do you individually stream on your own pages anyways for that? On our YouTube, we also have our own individual YouTube channels as well. So we post content on the main stump channel, which is all four of us and wow. sometimes some solo stuff. But then we also link it to each individual channel. So we all do our own recordings or maybe we'll take our stuff that we did on our solo day and then highly edit that and then put it up on our own YouTube channel as well. Especially a lot of the other group pages that I've seen a lot, a lot of times it's kind of individuals that have their own channels and they kind of have a, a central hub for it too. So it's kind of, do you guys regularly upload then to your own YouTube channels? Like, is that part of what you're going after with it as well? The more stuff you add, the more complicated, the more work it just is in general in terms of, you know, to your point of scheduling ahead and having that those things set, right? There's five members of Stumped and I'm the only one that doesn't mess with a, a personal YouTube channel. Everyone else has their own personal YouTube channel that they upload on on a pretty consistent basis. Our main Stumped Gamers account is, is obviously our, our biggest hub sure. of our community. And we usually try to always come up with interesting ways of like starting a series on the main channel and then referencing, hey, if you want to uh, catch the rest of the series, you can catch it on Jasmine's sure. channel or Anna's channel, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So then on the Stump channel, it's all edited VODs. Are you going into every stream individually thinking about videos that you can get for that main channel that you can create like when you guys go into stream as well? Or is that even something separate where you're recording off stream and thinking about other ways to make videos. At least 50% of our content is recorded off stream. We always go into it 
thinking about what we can put up onto the channel. Every single stream, we, we go into it with that idea. The stream itself, we never take just a, a pure VOD either because we don't want the overlays. We don't want uh, our, our webcam. Usually we'll record it, a separate webcam. We'll record a separate instance of OBS just to get a pure gameplay view. And even beyond that, when we're recording off stream, sometimes, especially if it's a multiplayer game where it's first person say, so everyone's perspective is different. All four members that are currently recording are recording their own perspective so that they can all be edited together and you can splice together videos mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Sweet. Yeah, that's, uh, that's <laughs> freaking awesome. I, I feel like too, there's a there's a degree too where it's like this hasn't been streamed so like nobody's seen this and then that content's like everybody gets to see it at the same time Do you, absolutely you like that yeah we highlight that on, on our stream saying you know oh man like you're seeing my perspective while you're live on stream but you're hearing jasmine screaming at something it was like tune into the episode to see what the yeah. hell she yeah. saw yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great <laughs> that's great because it's always it can be hard to bring people from like the stream to a video or a video to a stream or whatever. But like, I feel like that's a great, I don't correct me if I'm Absolutely. Talking, like, that's a great way to do it. It's a great way to cross community like that. And it, it is always an interesting challenge to find ways to, to encourage your own community to view on both platforms. This year, talking about kind of videos, one of your team members, Rick, left the on-screen creation side to do your editing, right? So what was some of the transition like for that and you know a, kind of a member leaving quote unquote the group it took a lot of planning we knew mm -hmm. about that six months before it like officially happened mm -hmm. we knew right away that we wanted anna to sort of take the place on screen to to do that so one of the very first steps that we had was just Anna join as guest appearances a lot more often to mm -hmm. just get our own community used to right to seeing someone new um, yeah because before then yeah. i was just I'd be there randomly, like I'd help out with, we do a 12 day long charity stream over Christmas called Stumpmas. So I always show up during those events or like sometimes I'll fill in, you know, if somebody was sick or if they needed, like if we were playing Among Us or something like that, and then we'd all play D&D &D together. So people were familiar with me, but it wasn't like a regularly scheduled sure. thing. Yeah. So there's that process. And then, I mean, with Rick becoming our editor we our, our file sizes are massive so there was a big component of just making sure technologically that internet and and scale of, of hard drives and whatnot was capable to to receive that kind of content even beyond the, the technical stuff and getting people used to Anna, there was there was a lot to that that helped and benefited with that shakeup, but also just to, to prep for. So with that shakeup, it really helped define our roles as a group a lot better because mm -hmm. Rick now became, you're the editing guy. So what, mm -hmm. what else? Because before we were all just kind of like doing everything like mm -hmm. together, but everyone was just trying to be a jack of all trades. And now it really helped us define our roles more once we we had people sort of like assigned to do a particular mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of have one of your on-screen guys, you know, in this group that, a lot of people know and love you move one to focusing on editing to your point like that specialization must have really increased your overall workflows i guess how did that communication go to the audience is there anything big you learned from that a success you had a lesson or anything i mean overall i do think that it was a success i think that overall the i think the, the biggest takeaway that i have is no matter how hard you may try to inform a large community of this change that's coming, there's always going to be a percentage that is completely unaware and will ask the same question mm -hmm. every single time. So just be as kind as you can in answering that every single time, because you're going to get that repeated question oh, yeah. a lot. That's great advice um, in general. <laughs> yep. like there's, there's so many like infinite same questions, like certain degree, you got to be comfortable telling people to yep. have that video up to send them to, which you oh, guys yeah. did have that video from Rick talking about it, right? We had a dedicated video of Rick sort of talking about the fact that he's having a second child and mm -hmm. that there's going to be some changes coming. And then and even another video of him just sort of explaining exactly what was happening, of him becoming the editor and, and stepping in. So there was, there was two dedicated videos for the shakeup. But I mean, obviously, those videos aren't going to hit your whole audience. And there's going to be people that maybe didn't tune in for a while that are still going to be confused. But I think overall, like we still make references within our recordings to the fact that Rick said in this and we'll, we'll shout out like, Rick, add this little funny picture right here. And yeah. so stuff like that. So people are still aware that Rick is, even if he's not on camera, even if you don't hear his voice, Rick is still involved in some way. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, the fans in the community have really enjoyed Rick's take on editing because Rick is such a good editor too. Like, he just has a really good comedic timing and like our among us videos i think are my favorite edits that rick has done but he'll like he puts in just it's just so funny and it's just so nice to be able to watch him flourish in this new role and be able to still support him yeah and like a lot of the people that are commenting too are like 
the editing is top tier. Like they've really enjoyed the fact that we now, now that Rick can do that full time is able to add a lot more into the editing and make just higher quality stuff for us. It's like a hype point, right? We're like, now this is something mm -hmm. that's even new to the audience. It's even more exciting because they can get more quality. So it's a good win. And that's cool how you, you know, frame that. And also like, that's what it is. So it's, you know, it's, it's a good win. Absolutely. Because I think that visually the audience has seen the difference yeah. because I'll be completely bluntly honest that I was editing quite a, a decent chunk of our content before. And I work a, a, a full-time job beyond this as well. So like my effort towards putting in additional funny moments and whatnot was pretty, pretty low on, on my sure. tier priorities. Yeah, yeah. And how did your guys' workload then change? And I guess even the stream performance change as a result of, you know, taking this team that was all working on some editing, some content, you guys are all working together to upload to then having the dedicated editor. Does that let you guys specialize more in what, you're doing and like does that did that help the overall experience yeah like i mean the very first thing that it did is it allowed us more time to stream because before we weren't streaming as much in the past we would only stream one day a week for player and so now we're streaming at least two which has been great mm -hmm. plus we have an additional day beyond that that we record for player off camera i mean just in terms of, of content generation that's been great at least one of the things that I, i've attempted to to have it be is is one of our four player streaming days has been what i like to call our return to to just playing whatever the hell we want without having to worry about it being okay we need to think about how this will translate to youtube or something like that it, it can just be our f around and have a good time kind of stream yeah something that we don't have to worry about numbers or money or stuff like that just to like like get back to the core of like co-op gaming like it's gaming with your friends and yeah. that's enjoyable instead of like we have to do this one series because it's hot right now or like it just came out stuff like that yeah it kind of like it gives you the the overall balance for it i guess from your guys' experience even for streamers starting out do you think it is important to have like even a, a freelance editor to help you with your editing process to be an additional support do you think it's better to build up some of your own of like what your vision is for it? Yes and no. Me coming into this, I feel like I have a good view of that. It can be financially difficult though to hire an editor. So if you are able to do that, I think that's a great idea. I was able to hire one of our friends, Brian, to do editing for me when we were just starting out. And I was just starting my YouTube channel because I also work full-time jobs and I didn't have that time to do it. But I learned a lot from watching his edits with my content that it was really helpful because I had no idea how to edit or what it was involved or like how to do comedic timing or like how to zoom in or do anything like that. So it was very helpful for me to have that. But like I said, at the same time, it's a barrier because you have to be able to pay someone to do that. I do think that like if you are starting out, it is beneficial to at least know the basics of how to edit so that you know yourself of what you like. If your goal is to eventually get an editor, then it helps to at least know some of the mm -hmm. tools in the tool set so you can set some sort of expectations with your editor on what at least you're familiar with and maybe even learn something from the editor themselves, but at least have some knowledge of, of how difficult that thing is so that you don't also put an unreasonable amount of work on your editor also. That's a good point. I want to talk a bit about your guys' community too, because obviously, you know, 500,000 subscribers, insane. You guys have your individual audiences, kind of that, you know, with the YouTubes as well, of everything that you've got going on over all of this time, you've got quite a dedicated community. What are some of the best ways that you've found to just engage with them? Like, is that Discord? Is that the streams and trying to focus everything into there? Is it Twitter? Is it the Patreon? Like, do you feel like there's been anything stand out in terms of, oh, they love it, we love it, this is a good way to do it? Of all the different social platforms and whatnot that we're on, like YouTube is obviously our home base. And then our biggest communities beyond that that we found to, to communicate with people Twitch is great. Twitch is our, our number two for sure. And then Discord and Patreon after that, I think for sure. The Twitter and the Instagram and TikTok, we hope to grow those more. TikTok especially over, over the next year is a big goal for us. Discord, especially when it comes to like notifications and keeping our community mm -hmm. informed of changes has been what we've been trying to drive everyone towards. And I, I think it's been a great place for, for our community to become informed, especially if they have a question, they'll be able to have it answered ridiculously quickly there, which also that is is it's super important to have good moderators if you if you do hope to achieve that kind of community building and, and quick information free community if i'm not mistaken you guys have a patreon a couple hundred supporters there right like do you yeah. integrate that then with discord and do you 
mainly focus on that as your delivery avenue for members there? Or do you also use Patreon and do native posts there? The primary amount of our content and rewards on, on Patreon are just native posts on Patreon. We do offer Discord integration and we do use utilize that towards say we're playing a game on stream and we want to get some additional people in there, we'll offer that to our patrons first, mm -hmm. which we have a, a private little channel on there. Nice. And then we'll offer it second to our subscribers and stuff like that. One of the best things that we utilize recently is something simple that I feel like a lot of content creators do, which is just to let your own community vote on what you play mm -hmm. um, on our, mm -hmm. our Patreon. We'll do that for our, our Patreon and we'll, we'll give them sort of like a week early access to it. And then that'll go up on our channel and our, our main channel will then see, hey, our patrons got to vote on this. They got to see it a week early. And then your whole community is exposed to this sort of idea that, hey, there's this Patreon where you can do right. that. Right. And, mm -hmm. and kind of get involved or be like, hey, I, you know, I want them to yeah. see you play this game. So I'm going to send the messages over there. And that's like some stuff it is like, oh, well, yeah, obviously that's what to do. But then not everybody even does that or can they try it, but they don't get any traction behind it. So it's really cool to see like your audience like, oh, yeah, this is a cool way to do it. And, Obviously, the way you're implementing yeah. it too, right? You do sometimes play games with the community then. Is that like yeah. a big co-op game that you guys play? Is there like specific days you have dedicated to that? Have you seen any big wins from it, I guess? Our patrons can always vote to have mm -hmm. one of those be the, the games that we'll do for the week. We do sometimes during stream, for example, we'll play... It was a silly game called Crab Game, which was the takeoff of, of Squid Game that allowed, I think, 60 or so people yeah. in there. We would do that a bunch of the community. Games like that where you can invite, like, we typically try to avoid games where you can only get, like, four or five because then it feels like we're sliding a whole bunch mm -hmm. of our community. But if there, there's games like Jackbox that yeah. can allow a ton of audience members in or, yeah, games that can allow Fall Guys was, was a recent one. That yeah, we did, Fall actually. Guys is, yeah. yeah because they have the private lobbies that you can you can get up to 60 people and stuff like that. Yeah. And since we got obsessed with GeoGuessr, that was one of the fun ones that we got to do where like the patrons voted to challenge the four of us against a GeoGuessr duel oh, yeah. and they kicked our butts. <laughs> It was we, so fun. We held our own for a bit. Anyway, uh, but yeah, it was like the the four of us on Stumped versus 16 of our, our community members yeah. trying, to, trying to get Geo guess against each other. Sure. Many creators start by playing one game. They can even get stuck into that one game. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's all they're even known for with it. You guys play such a variety, and even, you know, some people know you for certain games or whatever that might be for it. But I guess yeah. for creators who do want to switch it up, play a new game, variety of games, What's some of the best advice you have for taking that leap or to switch between these? It's, it's a double-edged sword. In my opinion, you should always play whatever you're drawn to because if you don't, then you're going to get burnt out and you're mm -hmm. going to you're going to hate what you're doing. But at the same time, I think it's super important to look at your analytics and see what's actually trending of the stuff that you're playing. Like you don't have to chase trends. I don't think that's ever a good idea necessarily. But find out what's clicking with your own community when you're mm -hmm. posting an episode or two. See see how those analytics are doing. And if you strike gold on something, I do think it's important to make that a series maybe make that a short focus and then mm -hmm. before you decide to give up on that i think it's about finding balance too because i think like we talked about in the very beginning like we all have games where it's our least favorite game that we all play but we all play it together right, right. yeah like ash was saying like you have to play games that you're passionate about and that you enjoy because burnout is so real especially like in the world that we're living in right now so like have that joy and have that passion because that's really important. That's what's going to keep you coming back day after day being a content creator yeah. is playing the games you enjoy playing. And yeah, sometimes you're going to play games where it may not be your favorite because it's doing really well, but make time for those games that you really enjoy. Exactly. I mean, everyone's community is different. And I, I won't say that like you'll find you're guaranteed to find success doing what you love, but at the same time, I say don't don't give up on it. Don't don't pigeonhole yourself into just being like just the gang beats channel and that's it. You know, so I think that's actually like the perfect place to even wrap this up. I want to say yeah. thank you guys for joining. If people want to check you out, hear more from you, see your group together, even chat about any of this. What's the best place to go to stumped gamers on YouTube or stumped.tv is sort of our, our main homepage. Perfect, guys. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining in today. Absolutely love the insight. Super cool to see you guys coming together and making content, working together as a group and making uh, making some cool stuff. Hey, Stone, Thank thanks you. so much for yeah. your happiness. Thank you so much. This was yeah. fun. Absolutely. Yep. And if you guys want to listen to any more podcasts or anything, of course, you can find them pipeline.gg. Thanks so much for listening and uh, happy creating, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. I wanted to just end this with a little bit of context on why we do what we do. We're former content creators ourselves, and we just really want to help as many content creators as we can. That's why we started Pipeline.gg. 
It's a platform where you can find other like-minded creators and learn from the pros who have already been there. Get step-by-step -step guidance so you can avoid all the mistakes that we made in the beginning. If you love the episode, there's going to be even more inside of Pipeline. So check it out. Head over to pipeline.gg.